Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike Moynihan here. Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. Another episode, we are, this is episode 81, believe it or not. And I was looking back and it's been almost two years since we started the podcast. And so I wanted to just say at the beginning, thank you to everybody that watches, that listens. Um, I think we're closing in on 300,000 total views on YouTube and listens on podcast format. So you guys definitely inspire me to keep this show going and keep uh, trying to bring great content, great knowledge, great experiences to you guys out there uh, about vintage and it because it's just such a passion of mine. And I hope that comes through uh, when I do these these talks with you with you guys today. I'm not going to talk by myself. That would be not as much fun. But we do have a legend joining us today and he would never say this. He's not on camera yet. Because, uh, but over the last few years, I, I've gotten to to know this guy, and um, obviously from afar for a long, long, long time. Every every month, I used to look forward to getting my Beckett Baseball Monthly uh, in the mail. I had a subscription, and it was a stalwart in my mailbox every month. And it's Dr. James Beckett from Beckett Sports Card Insights. Hey, Jim. Hey, Mike. I'm not here to talk about myself either. <laughs> not any uh, chrome or shiny cards or shiny cards that's right uh i i know but i that's why i can't bring you on before i give you props because uh you'll just be like eh, stop it mike but uh your impact on the hobby has been significant and you've been doing it for a long you've been in the hobby for a long long time and i'm not going to sit here everybody knows your story people listen to your podcast people you've been on this show at least once, maybe twice. And and so that, that story has been told. I want to talk, have you talk about some things maybe you don't talk about all the time. And my first question for you to discuss is kind of what's, what's a top of mind for you in the hobby today? Like, what do you, when you think about the hobby today, what, what comes to mind for you in terms of the direction that it's going and what's happening in the hobby today, the state of the hobby? Well, I mean, there's always uh, pivotal moments. I don't know there's a pivotal moment, but the, the hobby, there's a battle between the hobby and the industry, between the investors and the collectors and the dealers. And there, there needs to be a coexistence and a cooperation because you know, selling the hobby is an opportunity to get rich is, uh, is short-sighted, maybe not even true, but selling it as a fabulous pastime where you might make money, you might make a lot of money, uh, but along the way, you're going to meet a lot of great people. Uh, you're going to make lifelong friendships. And uh, whether you have cards for your whole life or you uh, buy and sell and trade more aggressively, uh, I, I really want people to you know, put the focus not just on the value, but on the value of the relationships and the value of your time. So I think you do that. I think many of the vintage collectors do that. Uh, I, I hope that's the case because otherwise, you know, the, this, this, the, uh, the run-ups that were a couple of years ago are unsustainable. You know, you're a financial professional, but anybody that's lived through some different business cycles realizes there's, there are cycles. And so if the cycle is generally up, that's good, but that doesn't mean everything has to go up. So I, I'm just worried about the unbridled optimism and uh, without trying to splash cold water on everything, I just think people ought to temper some of that enthusiasm that everything isn't going to go up forever. And uh, 
the great thing is when something seems to be overpriced, it's kind of like a stock market. If you think one sector is overvalued, you can you can go to another one. There's so many sectors and they're creating new sectors, even in vintage. There's vintage publications now. Who knew? Right. Yeah, it's it's certainly come a long way. You used a word there, battle, that I think is happening in the hobby between the different parts of the hobby that you mentioned, the industry and the and the collectors and the investors and all. And unfortunately, I think that battle feels like there has to be a winner. And and I want the winner to be the hobby, right? And so I don't know what that looks like necessarily, like who ultimately comes out on top in terms of pricing platforms and grading platforms and all these things. Well, the culture, the culture is has moved into a very adversarial culture. It's it's us against them. It's those guys. It's the people that think or do things differently than I do. And that, that's a that's a troubling thing for our country. That, that no doubt. you're for or against. There there are a lot of false dichotomies. Uh, I think there's so much, there's a whole spectrum of ways to enjoy the hobby, and it doesn't have to be us against them. New new cards against old cards. I, I think you can appreciate everything. And, and, and the true definition of tolerance is not that I agree with you. I think you're right. It's that I respect your right to have the different opinion. And I, I don't agree with it, but I, I want to hear why you think that. And I want to respect that you're not, you're not an idiot. You're not a liar. You're not evil. You just have a different perspective than I have. And that goes for politics, for religion and collecting or anything else that people feel strongly about. Again, the beauty of it is people feel strongly. That's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. I, I use that word respect a lot when I talk about other aspects of the hobby that I'm not necessarily interested in or even think is necessarily a good idea. But people need to hobby like they want a hobby. You know, your hobby is your hobby. You define what that is. And if you like collecting, you know, 1950 Bowman common guys that have the last name that starts with Q, I mean, I don't care. Like, it doesn't affect me. And I think that's what I think the problem is. People let it affect them, what other people do. And it's like, wait a second. Don't. Just do your thing. You do well, you, right? Everybody in the hobby, I think, even if they're not that interested in the money, uh, you know, they, as a hobbyist, would they prefer to make $1,000 on a card that they bought and sell it for 1000 bucks more? They'd obviously prefer that to buying a card and selling it for a thousand bucks less than what they paid for it. Okay. But the only sure way, which I am doing now to avoid that is I don't buy cards for a thousand bucks. I can't <laughs> lose a thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> but you have the, but the higher the price, then that you have the greater chance to make more, but to lose more. And if you want to play at that level, then I, I used to, I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. And I just, I, I, I would say I sleep like a baby, but I'm getting old. And so I think there's this thing that all old people start sleeping like babies. <laughs> That's right. Wake except, up when we have to, <laughs> except when we have to wake up and go pee in the middle of the night. Yeah, like you betcha. Oh, man. Uh, you know, during the, the rush, I, you know, especially with in retrospect, with wonderful 2020 hindsight, I look back and go, man, if I cared about the money as much as like, again, like you said, all we all care about, it's not that we don't care about the money aspect. It's impossible not to, because we're putting a lot of money in it, whether it's buying a one, one, $1,000 card or $1,001 cards, it is still money that we are expending and we, we care. And so I, I wish, you know, I think, Oh man, should I have gone back? You know, should I have sold everything and then just bought it back now? And I think of, A, what a complete pain in the rear that would have been. Would I be able to find everything, you know, all the time that it would have taken me to do that? And I think, oh, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I am. I don't uh, I don't begrudge not doing that. I don't think, oh, it should have, would have, could have, wish I would have, you know, done all these different things. Because the hobby is going to be here for me in 20 years, the same as it is today. And so I just don't think about it that way. Is that Two things. One is that I also cannot, it's very difficult for me. It'd be problematic for me to rebuy. I mean, buy things that I used to have that I sold. When I started the company, you know, I capitalized the company, 
largely by selling a, a lot of older sets and things that I'd accumulated. Okay, so that made me not have to borrow money to start a company. And so I, I have no regrets about that. So, But rebuying those, those sets or those cards that I had would be, would be awkward for me, and I just don't think I could do it. Secondly, is that you epitomize the value buyer. And so I think you have less exposure. It's like, it's like uh, stock market pickers that are looking for solid companies that may be trading at a discount to their current and future prospects. And so you have less volatility, you know, in, in, because everything has some level of volatility. To, but people that are buying high and selling higher, buying the latest thing, um, you know, that's that's living hard and potentially dying hard. Right. Yeah, I, I, I look back and it, to use some vernacular from the financial world, you know, I, I feel like I bought some things right. Absolutely. Know? What you showed me at the National, what you bought at the National, you, you could have asked everybody in the room, how much did I pay for all this stuff? And I think that everybody would be off by 50%. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I, you know, it was harder to find deals than normal nationals, uh, nationals past. It's certainly prior to 2020. Well, it was but, harder, but it's not impossible for you because you've studied it, you've done the homework, but it's literally impossible for people that have not paid their dues because all they can do is, 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 is look at eBay comps or something without any understanding of the historical perspective. And so they really can't do it, Mike. And so you've, yeah. you've paid your dues for a long period of time. I have too. And so you have perspective and that means, you know, a good deal when you see it, yeah. people don't have to tell you it's a good deal. You know, it's a good deal. Yeah. And I'm also willing to walk away. Like I don't need it today. And, and that's unfortunate, you know, just a mentality of certainly a younger generation is I want it now and not realizing the marathon nature of our hobby, that it's not a sprint. Um, but that's not something you can teach someone. You can tell someone that to your blue in the face. <laughs> they don't get it until they no, get it. It's, no, because, because they're right to some degree. Because my regrets, if I look back, of the deals I didn't make, that I, I didn't go one more bidding increment, uh, and I've told some of the stories, is they're, they're iconic cards that I would have been greatly rewarded. You know, I, I it just, it still bugs me. And yet I've got a great collection otherwise, but th they're notable examples of when I didn't think, hey, I'm going to pay a little bit more for this really iconic rare card. Then it would have been a good financial deal if I would have. And yeah. I didn't, and that's okay. So that's what they're thinking. They're thinking that philosophy or that, that will hold true for, for decades for you know for for into the foreseeable future i'm not positive it does at some point things just can't get that much more expensive because you're you're it's 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 it used to be equal to a car now it's equal to a house now it's equal to a a, a small island somewhere <laughs> right. you know, you're talking to eight figure cards now that's that's crazy and yeah, really, yeah. I, I have those moment I, I and i remember it's funny i remember the cards i didn't buy that i wish oh i would have bought that versus the great deals that i've oh the great great deals have been way more cards i regret not buying and yet i remember these vividly and i oh I should da, da. and but i try and you know look i like you said i've got i feel like i have a wonderful i have a great collection that i love right that's all that really matters and i'm adding to it all the time there's still more stuff I want to buy and add to it, but it's, it's fun because there doesn't have to ever be an end. And people, people always ask me, what's, what's your end game? And it's, I don't need one. I don't want one. I don't need one that if there's an end to it, that means there's a finality to it and it will end some someday. I'm not going to be here anymore. <laughs> and that's for sure when it will end. But until that point, I want to enjoy it and, make sure that we, that I'm doing the things so that Julie can, you know, dispose of it as however she needs to down the line. But that's, I'm not wanting to get into that. I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> so, okay. Let me, let me bring up another topic for us to discuss. Uh, when you think of this evolution of the current market and where we are in the hobby and you think back to long ago, I mean, you basically brought pricing of sports cards to the masses through the annuals and then the 
monthly so monthly magazines do you th- what do you think about today's hobbyist and the way they price cards it's so much more real time today than it used to, you know used to be i'd wait a month to see if the card was worth more or worth less and look in the magazine if there was an up arrow or a down arrow what do you think about the landscape of that today well the the problem is if you got you got this 99% of the cards that are worth 10 bucks or less <laughs> right 1% or less that are that are worth more than 10 bucks and you know the magazines and some of the periodicals and and uh, the Beckett OPG and some of these things can handle the $10 and under cards pretty well, but nobody cares about those. Okay. It's the $10 and up or a hundred dollars and up or a thousand dollars and up that get a lot of the action. And that's the part where people, you know, these, these, uh, these price movements of 10% or 20% or 50%, you know, in a short period of time, it, you, you want to be armed with the latest information. But that's a small percentage of the hobby. But but the trickle trickle down effect suggests that if these glamour cards go for more, it's going to pull some of these under ten dollar cards. But if if I if somebody offered uh, it went around the show and said I've got a thousand ten dollar cards here, uh, that's ten thousand dollars. What would you what would the offer be for him? Would it even be a thousand bucks? I I don't even know. I, I'm not even sure. It might even be less than that. Right. And so they don't think of it. Whereas a ten thousand dollar card, they're going to want to, you know, eight thousand bucks or something. They they're right. willing to take that. And so the 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 uh, and and the you know and the cost of trading and all that stuff is there's a lot more friction with the cheaper cards. But um, and you know and you again you're you're dealing. My perception is that I'm dealing with a dollar box and, you know, like that. And I'm just having fun with it. And you're dealing with mostly cards that are hundreds of dollars. Okay. Not thousands. Although you've got some very nice cards that are now worth more. And even some of the ones you've gotten, you've paid more than that, but it's the exception. And I think the mainstream of the vintage hobby is are people that are, you know, walking around the show, not with thousands of dollars, but with hundreds of dollars. Yeah, because that's 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 most of America that would be the collecting public, but the the publicity and the headlines are being made by, and it's not even enough. A five figure card is not even no big deal. Yeah, it's six figures or or seven and now eight. Yeah, I I think there's a perception, especially you guys that watch me all the time, and and I will call it a misconception is that I just have all these super high dollar cards. And the reality is the beast back here is filled with plenty of $20 bills and $50 bills and hundred dollars share of what my collection contains. And I love picking that stuff up as much as I love buying a satchel page 49 Bowman. Uh, I really do because I'm adding a new card to what I'm trying to do and what my focus is and what I enjoy. So there's a lot more of the $20 and $50 bills in the beast than there are, you know, comma cards. Um, For, for, for a a non-collector, I I can't imagine any non-collector without giving some explanation would not prefer whatever the price is, the 53 page over the, over the 49 page or even the leaf. The leaf is not an attractive card. It's a it's a short print. It's out of register a lot of times. So the most beautiful card, the most attractive to to somebody that didn't know the rarity, would be a fifty three tops page. No and doubt. yet the value differential is 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 huge. Is huge because those, yeah. the the forty eight forty nine ones are just so they're, they're rare, even within their series. Right. Um. I'm telling you, every time someone comes here and you pro- non-collectors, non-hobbyists, all the questions I get are about value. How much is this worth? How much is that worth? What's your most expensive item? Da, 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 da. They don't understand, and nor do I expect them to, where each card fits in the history of the hobby or, or why is it important to me or where does it fit in this craziness of, of a card room or, or an entire collection. And that's okay. Um, when I think of the value thing, the 
the instantaneous value need when people are making deals at shows and and the the flipper guys and all that you know there's they're, they're looking at ebay Call about the accuracy of the data that always concerns me is is this a fake comp is it a did vcp for example on a vintage card does it have everything that has been done that's that's knowable are they get are they capturing all of the data uh, I don't use market movers or card hedge or any of the other online pricings. I either use eBay comps or I'm using VCP. That that's pretty much my kind of go-tos. And uh, and I just I look at the last sales and for with and I offer to a dealer and sometimes they say yes and sometimes they say no. But uh, I know where I want to be on a card. I want to buy it right. And if if I can't, there'll be another, I'll just keep walking and there'll be another one, you know, somewhere down the road. It's not. Well, you, like I said, you've got the knowledge, plus you, you're able to disconnect from the buying the card, not the holder. You want the holder because you you are got your PSA registries and things like that. But you know that uh, the, the, the grade to value uh, relationship is not captured in a number always. And so by doing that, you're. The, the, That's the true. data accumulators don't like that because you're you're paying more for a three than you would for a four. And and that upsets their if they're doing it algorithmically, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but the three has better eye, it's a better looking card. I'm with you. I'm you're right. So uh, that happens. That's okay. Like, but, but there are other people that buy the buy the holder just for the numerical grade, and th that's okay too, I guess. I know, um, they can't. They can't not do that, Mike, because they don't. They're not. They haven't been to school. They don't. They don't. They they don't. When they go to sell, they may find out that they uh, that that it's more than just the the holder. Right. So I want to talk to you about your style now, Jim. You are way different in the cards on your wall back there all terribly often you are when i see you at uh shows and stuff I, I i basically go to the dollar boxes and look for where you're where you're parked for the day um what are you when you're looking through dollar box there's a lot of people out there that love go, like love doing that style of collecting what are you particularly looking for what is the the eye of dr beckett looking for well, you know, I sold the company in 2005, and I really pretty retired from day-to-day -day pricing in 96, late 96 after my heart attack. So I basically, all the stuff in the dollar box pretty much is 96 to the present. And so I'm getting an education to see what's what's there. I I, I say I've, every, every show I go to, I see cards I've never seen before. There's too many for me to know them all. And I know a lot. I've seen a lot. But if it's cards in the 50s, I've already had them all. So I don't, I don't need to be uh, completing another set or putting something together there. So, so I'm, I'm uh, exploring. I'm exploring. It's, a, it's an Easter egg hunt. I'm panning for gold, a little tiny nuggets. But uh, I'm enjoying that. And I'm seeing stuff I don't normally see. And if like something might be the uh, tougher variation of something. And I'm, okay, well, I, I used to keep track of the long tail. Well, I still, I still am dealing with a long tail. And I don't care if they're chrome or shiny. That, in fact, a lot of the stuff, if it's too shiny or too chromey, I pass on by, because they're they're uh, you know the the more recent, super shiny stuff. Maybe there's an additional category. It, it's blinding. Uh, so uh, you know, but if it's a little bit older to where I think that's that's interesting. That that like I say, the tougher parallels or the tougher. Uh, you can't just go by the serial number, but you know there's some that are have a high number, but that are tough, and some that have a low number that are easy. And so I'm gradually learning that, and um, you know I'm a, I'm a price guide guy at heart. That's that's part of my DNA, I think. I could do a price guide now for for the dollar boxes. I mean, I know what's in there. I know what's you know if Geno Smith ever. Uh, uh, gets a whatever the ability to win games uh he's all over the dollar boxes and he's resurrecting he's getting a, a second third or fourth or fifth chance so right. that's the kind of stuff that's in there well i'm not going to pick up base cards but if something's i picked up matthew stafford's two years ago just because he was a, a, a 
kind of a friend of my son's, you know, and, and a great quarterback too. And from around here, but I started, I'll just pick up some of those be good for trade material from around here. So, and now he's a Super Bowl winner. And surefire hall of famer in my opinion. Yeah. He's that's he, that's his ticket. He's yeah, punched he, his ticket. Now. He just punched his ticket. What, uh, so what, give me some examples of some cards that you found in dollar boxes, even recently, maybe even at the national where you went, wow, that's super cool. Uh, I can't believe this is in a dollar box. Well, it's not that exotic. I mean, I, I, I wish if, if it was, if it was that great, Mike, everybody would be doing it. So I'm not finding hundred dollar cards. I'm finding five and $10 cards. And I, I've got to be content with that. I, I, I'm not greedy. I just, and so it's, it's, uh, it's more, it's probably for me not slugging percentage, but batting percentage and on base percentage. I mean, I'm trying to trying to get singles and doubles. If if I were looking for home runs, uh, I I just I, it wouldn't be as much fun. Right. So I'm just trying to get. I'm, I I want to I want to go home with a with a nice stack of cards that I can have fun processing, and I'll find when I get home that I I'll kind of evaluate how did I do. Well, I picked out some stuff that you. I thought would be good, and it wasn't. Now, if it's Rangers or Stars or Cowboys or, or Mavericks, I, I, I don't. It's I can't lose because I'll right. just I'll stash them away in my player collections and be ready for guests that come over that that uh, like the local teams. So the stuff that you don't stash away, do you actively resell that? And what platforms do you use to do that? I'm now selling on eBay uh, this year, and so I'm selling. Uh, but my first cut okay. is uh, is Comp C, you know stuff that's you know the mid price stuff. It's it's a good it's good for anything. I, I like those guys, so I and they do all the work, uh, and so I don't want to ship one card at a time. So I can you know give them give them a bunch of cards, and then uh, some of the other players that I can lot together, I'll put on eBay, and then the stuff below that I'll either keep here for my uh, collecting or I give them to Rich. Right. For his synagogue show or for whatever he wants to do. And so everything, every card has a place. Every card has a place. I love it. But I've been enjoying the eBay. I've figured out a way to do it that's that's less hassle for me. To, to keep it simple because otherwise I otherwise I got to get employees and all that stuff. So I'm trying to keep it really simple. And uh and so I'm having fun with it. I'm getting hands, I'm getting cards that I don't want that still have value, but not a lot of value, not extraordinary value. To in the hands of people that are going to say, wow, I can't believe I got this lot of Jose Canseco's and uh, look at this. I've never seen this one. You know, I go to the dollar boxes. Like I said, I, I'm buying, I'm literally buying every card I've never seen before. Okay. Makes sense. Regardless of who the player is. If Does I've that... never seen it before and I, I recognize, I recognize that I haven't seen it and it's not good. I haven't seen it because it's, ultra common and I, they're just never in there. Gotcha. There, there's some distinction to it. And I think I haven't, so I'm going to take that home. And, and, you know, there's an article in the PSA magazine, which I think is pretty well done there. Their PSA is coming on pretty strong here. And I, I hope that gets, uh, gets my old company in gear to respond. Cause I'd still like to see them do market leadership. But they had a really cool article this month on the different exotic Panini skins whatever you know Parallel. snake skin and yeah. tiger and, and giraffe elephant and and, and uh, zebra and stuff like that and i thought that was well done so but if i see something like that yes for a dollar i'm gonna put that in there but that doesn't happen very often but has it happened yes so does that create a sustainability for you yes. that you can see just be like okay i can do this in perpetuity because i have to show yeah. Every show I come back and I tell my lovely wife, Diane, I say, I cannot believe it. I, 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 she said, well, you came back with another couple boxes of cards. What's going on? I said, every time I go, I think people are going to, they're going to see me coming and they're going to say, we don't want your business. You're buying, you're buying, you're getting too good of a deal, but they're doing the opposite. They're saying, thank you for buying a bunch of cards that nobody else is looking at or yeah. that nobody else wants those. I mean, they're they're in the dollar boxes looking for the Aaron judges, and nothing right. against that. But that's uh, you know, and, and the, those kind of guys, Juan Soto, 
but they're base cards or they're, they're, you know, low level kinds of things. I think, well, I don't need that. I've seen those. They're not interesting to me. But it does. I think it's cool how that create when you come back to Diane with these cards, you're like, but don't worry. They were paid for by the last couple of boxes of cards that I brought home from the last show. Right. She's there's not a she's not complaining <laughs> right i mean uh, yeah no it, it's a, it's it's more than a break even thing uh, but even if it was a break even thing that what's so bad about that i'm Nothing. having a great time i'm doing what i want to do and i can do it kind of in stereo i i can i can kind of be doing that i can't really carry on an intimate deep conversation with anybody but i can you know kind of take a break here and there and so it's 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 working for me, but like I said, every show I think I'm going to come back empty-handed, or I'm going to pull out these couple hundred cards, and they're going to look through them and say, "How did you find these in the dollar box? I, we cannot sell you those. Not only can you not get a discount, you're going to have to pay a surcharge. Those are those are all five dollar cards, and I'm going to charge you two bucks for them. And, and I'm going to think I just spent an hour looking through this stuff, and they're going to hold me up and extort me." It's never happened yet. It did happen. I saw it happen when somebody did that, but it didn't happen to me. So that would be that would be a deal breaker for me. That'd be that'd be no longer doing business with that person. But it, it like I said, it's it's the most uncanny thing. It has nothing to do with who I am. It's they're happy that I'm buying. In many cases, no name players. I mean, that's one of the keys. It's low demand, but probably low supply or interesting supply. And low demand. The low demand guys, who wants those? Nobody's player collecting somebody that I've barely heard of. But then I'll take it home. I'll study up. I'm 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 learning. You know, I'm learning. These guys are because there's 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 uh, baseball and football, especially basketball too. There's they they're not never wases, but they they're but they're never going to make it. You can right. tell by their age, their position, whatever. They're they're not a good bet. And yet at the time their card was issued. They, they were, you know, a, a potential, potential. Right. But now five years later, they're in there and, and, and there's, there's very little chance unless the guy go into announcing or, or does something, uh, you know, gets a Nobel prize or something. It's not, not, not going to happen. Yeah. I, every time I see you at a show at a dollar box or at a table, I'm like, God, I'm about to interrupt, you know, the no, I don't think that. Don't think from, that. Uh, other people, I don't think, think that. <laughs> What's that? Other people don't think that. I'm not, <laughs> I want to be uninterruptible. Now, I don't want to spend two hours. You know, I, I'd rather just take a break. And it, it, like I said, if it's something more deeper, I, I got to just I got to just stop. But, uh, you know, Rich and I coexist and just, you know, kibitz back and forth, you know, a lot for a long time. Yeah. But we, we, we know each other pretty well. So don't feel, you know, pre, feel free. Not, not a problem at all. Do you have times? I know, you know, a lot of the dealers, that, especially at the shows that you frequent and they know you're coming kind of thing. But at the same time, there's probably a lot of dealers in our hobby today. All the new people, the new blood in the hobby that just don't know who you are. Right. You true, know, true. does that happen a lot? It, uh, fair enough. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't, I mean, uh, my business was to find out what was going on. I mean, it was collectors and dealers, but we wanted to have a balanced uh, two-way street there. But, but when our guys, including me, were out there, we we needed to, uh, to to understand what was going on, what the dealers take on the show, and on, on what was selling for them, and all that stuff. But I don't have to do that anymore, Mike, and I, I haven't had to do that for a long time. And so now, just to be a regular guy, just to be a collector, I, d I don't need to do an industry assessment when I walk the show. I mean, I like, and so mainly, and it probably got this way toward the end is that, you know, we, we had lots of sources, but I had some key sources for the books and the magazines, guys that I knew really well, that were ultra trustworthy, high integrity, uh, did a lot of volume, and I could really respect that they were shooting straight with me. And so those people I still see, and I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I go out to dinner with those guys, you know, a lot of them, so. But it's got to be refreshing to be reasonably anonymous now versus what you were in the hobby when you were running Beckett. So you're saying my disguise is working? Well, you certainly don't look like any of the cards that I have you on, you know, <laughs> so you, yeah, you you've, uh, like a fine wine aged very well. I'm hoping, but, I'm hoping yeah. But it, it's nice to, you know, I have when I go to a show, I don't 
people come up and say hi and it's great and I appreciate it and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but I have to kind of balance that. I'm trying to look for cards too. So I, well, you have, you have a, you have a distinctive voice, a different uh, look presence, you know, from your, your, your YouTube fame, you know, or as I, I'm just a podcaster. So I don't think people are recognizing my voice and I've never put myself out there to be the poster boy for the hobby. So, uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah. So let me ask you one other question here as we talk through kind of where the hobby is and where it might be going. So I've really two more topics, I guess, total. But what do you think, this, if you were to say this period of the hobby correlates very similarly, obviously the circumstances are always unique, but when does when, when do you kind of equate this period to? Do you go, oh, this reminds me a lot of when in the hobby to you? I think it's unprecedented. I, I think we have so much big money coming in and, uh, you know, they're, they're building the infrastructure for, for the next wave of growth, Mike. So, I mean, uh, that's really encouraging and that shouldn't require uh, a 25% increase. It, it, actually what they're looking for is a 25% increase in collectors every year. I, I'd love to see that too, but that doesn't mean we're going to have a 25% increase in the pricing every year. And so, and, and, and in the financial markets, nothing marches uh, lockstep like that. So to think we're always going to be in a mixed market and that there's always going to be some things going up, some things going down, some things that are, uh, no one perceives anything to be overvalued usually. I mean, they, they, that's unpleasant to think that because if I have it, then I, that, that's what it's worth. Right but things can come down and you set that aside. On the other hand, you in particular have figured out, I believe this is a good deal. I believe this is undervalued compared to all these other things. And if people are able to do that math for themselves, just like the stock market, you could say the stock market is, is overpriced. Okay. Does that mean every stock is overpriced? No. And there's certain sectors that are probably going to do great. And if you can figure out what that is, you know, but people are, they're running in a herd mentality to, okay, we're all going to run over to F1 now. Uh, we're we, we're going to run over to soccer now. And we're going to run over to uh, graded Sports Illustrated and ticket stubs and stuff like that. And each one of those things has some merit and, and they may have their day in the sun. But again, to get it back to what you and I think really believe is that the enduring, you know, vintage and vintage baseball probably has been the enduring. Uh, pace setter for the industry for decades for 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 a century, but for yeah. decades, yeah. You know, I, I too agree. We are in an unprecedented time. To to say it's like the junk wax era is wrong. I think it's just not true. People think that and gravitate towards that because it was a period of overproduction and and low value and values decreasing quickly and a lot of things. I just think we're the industry itself, the money coming in, the companies being created, the infrastructure, like you said, being created today to support the sports card hobby is unlike any time we've ever seen. And those people that are putting all that money in are not going to let it just die on the vine. And they're going to work hard to fanatics is going to work very hard to promote sports cards. There is, Zero question that they are going to do everything they can to grow the sports card market, whether it's marketing, advertising, right. uh, distribution methods. They're going to come up with every way to grow this hobby. Will they be able to hit a target of 25% growth in the number of collectors? I don't know. I, I mean, we'll, time will tell. I, I wish I could. They would like to know, too, whether or not they're going to be able to pull this off. But, I, I think they could. But the uh, the junk wax era. And the fanatics have this in common that they expect to eventually get rich off baseball cards and sports cards, trading cards. Okay. Because it wasn't a get rich quick thing. I don't think in the junk wax era, it was setting aside these cases that you're buying seemingly cheap and you're going to put them away for your, 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 your retirement and stuff like right. that. And that, that didn't materialize in the way they thought. Okay. That's not what's happening now. Now it's more of a get rich quick thing. I mean, there was some flipping going on back in the day, you know, 30, 35 years ago, but now it's, 
you if you put it back you're you're hoping to flip it next year and as long as fanatics doesn't go to this short term mentality that's why i hope they don't go public anytime soon uh or anybody in the industry goes public anytime soon then they're going to help build the industry and the infrastructure and that's that's a win for all of us okay that is the scary part of the whole fanatics thing is that they if they only think short term they're going to Mess let up. all the air out of the balloon very quickly. If, if they think long term, we want to do this. We want to own. We want to be the juggernaut in this hobby for the next twenty five years. Then I think the next few years is optimistic, right? And the good thing about fanatics is that they just want to sell sports stuff. in terms of what they'll do. They want to sell stuff. They want to sell other people's stuff. And so if they're doing that, then they they want to be the place where people go to get sports stuff. You know, whether it's uh, caps or jerseys or cards or memorabilia, they want to be the place synonymous with that. And that has a huge market potential. Yeah, so for I'm sure. They can do it. But like I said, I agree. If it if they do any kind of get rich quick stuff, that is that's that's not good. And I, I'm hoping that Josh Luber, again, if you've got a chief vision officer, you probably ought to listen to him. <laughs> right. But hopefully he has the right vision. Right. You can have a chief vision officer with a yeah. with a flawed vision. And I don't like I don't know that I would do any better in that position either. I And I'm a business guy and everything. I just it's hard to see like it, the go with the flow mentality doesn't work for these companies. They have to have a strategy. They have to have here's what we're going to do next to, to build this to make the pie bigger. Um, I'm more of a let's just see how the pie grows, you know, and maybe it doesn't. Well, no, but I mean, Procter and Gamble, you know, right. knows how to make pies grow, but that they're packaged goods and, and uh, consumer products and things like that. And they know how to market and, and to make, make you feel like you really have to have this thing, but we aren't toothpaste. We're right. not shampoo. So I, I think that the Josh Lubers of the world, the, these, these uh, vision officers and the people that are helping to decide the Nat Turners, you know, they're, they're either going to be passionate collector gene type people or they're going to be packaged goods people and if they're packaged good people they're going to try to maximize sales instead of optimizing sales and optimizing sales means looking at the the, the future and not just this quarter or even this year yeah but, you're right those are very different states of mind to be in optimization versus maximization uh very, very true. Great point. You're a public company and you have a, you, you do your annual meeting and you start talking about you're not maximizing uh, shareholder value as determined by the stock price, let's say. I mean, they, they, they're going to say, we need a new board. We need right. a new leadership. Yeah, you're fired. Yeah. What, uh, last topic, and we'll get back to, I know Gary's like, I just wanted to talk to Dr. Beckett about some things that he doesn't normally maybe discuss, but vintage they're just purely talking vintage strictly vintage um slow and steady from here status quo from here what do you see over the next two to three years in the vintage market uh i'd like it to be slow and steady and i don't think it can be because i think there's too much uh you know in the days of social media and and uh and, and the sensationalism that's occurring now I don't think it it can go back to slow and steady. Slow and steady would be boring. Uh, slow and steady would be my preference, but I don't think we can go back to that. Uh, you know, in fact, if 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 cards grew eight percent this year, then all it did was keep up with inflation. So how's that for a? Is that some kind of great investment? So so I don't think it's slow and steady. I think it's going to continue to be volatile. I do hope. That it, and and believe that it's probably going to be more up than down, but there's going to be some adjustments. I mean, the other the main adjustment I think could be not so much in the player hierarchy, but in the relationships between grades, and and the the ultra premium for a ten or a nine or an eight over seven six five as you go down, it's it's like a, a Richter scale, you know, a seven point uh, earthquake is 10 times more powerful than a 6.0. Right. It's not 
16 percent. It's it's a whole order of magnitude more. And an 8.0 is another 10 times more than that. And that's what it's it's getting more logarithmic. And I think we could see a compression of that. Uh, there already is for the newer cards, but for the older cards, you're pointing out that in, in your buying habits, and you're not the only one, you're not necessarily the pace setter, but you represent that thought that a five is a great card. And if a five is a fraction of what a nine is, much less a 10, then the nine out of 10 people are going to want the five, I think. Yeah. And, I, I think and that tenth car, the tenth one, is going to compete, be competing with some other ultra wealthy people, and that's perhaps not representative of the hobby. And so it, you might find that when the PSA ten or the SGC nine point five Rosen find uh, fifty two mantle, as those things go way way up, there are limits to how that's going to affect a PSA or a BGS or an SGC five. Mantle or four or three or two, because they're different demographics. They're different populations that are going after them. So they don't have. To, and so that would be shocking to the system, because Card Ladder in particular, with their predictive pricing algorithms, if 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 the ten goes up, then the nine is going to follow. That has happened almost all the time, but there's no assurance that that'll always be the case. There's a limit to what people are going to pay, and we and we're probably going to find that out. And so. Right. There are no sure things. Buy what you like, and you can't lose. And buy and and you're like I said, you're a value buyer. I think you're you're an excellent example of someone that has passion and discipline. Rare um, to see with both. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's taken me a long time to become that, but it's uh, experience is a wonderful teacher. <laughs> seasoning, yes. Um, I, I I agree with you a lot about. The disconnect, the the wealth gap, so to speak, between the super high end and the more mainstream cards, right? Uh, there's just more people that can afford them. I, I think they'll just become more popular because that's the sandbox that most people can play in, quite frankly. And so, I think the popular, the overall popularity of vintage will grow slow and steady. You use the word boring. I like boring quite frankly, in terms of my card market, because I still have a lot of stuff I want to get. It's going to take me a long time to do it. The more boring over the next five years, the better, because it allows me to find those values and find, you know, accumulate cards slowly for my collection. Well, the corollary to what my, my dollar box strategy is when I'm buying cards that I haven't seen before. Uh, if you're a vintage collector, if you're buying what everybody is picturing Everybody is talking about, everybody is showing, everybody is chasing. That's a recipe for paying high prices. Right. If you're going for things that people are not talking about, are not bragging about, then would that be boring? It's it's not interesting enough that it's making headlines. And so it's either the player or the set or the condition. And so I, I think just the act of, of something being talked about and shown increases the price of something. So just like in the dollar box, I'm looking for things that people are not talking about, that people are not showing. And uh, again, they're just, you know, that's fun for me. If you want to have what everybody else has, then you're, you're going to, you're going to be in an, in an expensive auction. Great Especially point. if it's in the same condition, if it's in the condition that everybody would ooh la la over, I want to ooh la la over a, a, a nice card that I got at a good price. You know, Me too. anybody can overpay if they've got enough money, but it takes a sharp eye as a collector and, and, and the passion, like I say, passion and discipline to say, this is the card to get. This is this is the best value to enjoyment uh, and price uh, relationship. I'm going to be excited to have this card in my collection because it fits because because it's not my only card. <laughs> Some of these people, I just think I'd have to sell everything to to, to get the one card. Right. Yeah, I don't think that way either. I, I appreciate your insight and your wisdom, uh, Dr. Beckett, talking just through all these different things and uh, appreciate you being on the show. And uh, any final thoughts? Well, thank you for what you're doing, Mike. I mean, I think that if, if the vintage is not strong, then, then Fanatics is not going to do well. I mean, there has to be the legacy of the older cards being appreciated 
and uh, and you you go a long way toward promoting that and that, that is absolutely necessary well you do too and i appreciate what you do uh, if you don't listen to uh dr james beckett sports card insights on podcast you definitely need to go check him out uh, he does almost daily podcasts they're wonderfully short 15 10 to 15 minutes a piece i think you do a great job Dr. Beckett, and just throwing out little nuggets of different topics that you put on your show. So thank you for continuing to be a part of our hobby and contributing your experience and helping people understand what's going on. I appreciate that. Uh, same to you, Mike. I agree. You're, you're, uh, you're one of the, one of my must listens as well. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Hopefully I'm one of your must listens <laughs> and uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Beckett again. And we'll see you guys next week for another episode of Golden Age of Cardboard Podcast. Have a good week and keep collecting.